the general for the Overberg region, which I now have a vested interest in finding more about. General, who appointed her? Uh, General Patekile, the current provincial commissioner. But before, how did she get in? When did she become a brigadier? Uh, she became a brigadier in 2011, so it's more or less just between Trele and Piecha's time. I can't remember who was the I've got a feeling it's Piecha, because yeah. I can remember a guy that I know in the public relations industry saying that there's this low-level PR person yeah. who was close to Piecha, who was her PA, who has become a brigadier in the police yeah. and how horrified he was. So there's another little part for your yeah. for your next video. I'm not going to use too much of my time here, but just to just to ask you, uh, and, and, and what we found at this conference is that we can pull quite a lot of dots or join the dots, pull quite a lot of pieces together. And in the Dorator interview, it was a consistent theme that they found people who had been miscreants. They were arrested. In many cases, Eskim took them to the police station. And the next day, according to Dorator, there was a phone call from Anhai and the person was released. Correct. You've made the same um, um, number of, of examples here. A fish rots from the head, but how rotten is this fish? How far down does it go? And I'm looking at post-2024, please God, with a different government and how far would you have to clean this boat before you can start getting it on an even keel? So I, I would go as far as saying that if we don't replace, or let's start rather like this, I would start with a skills audit of the national management of the police, brigadier and upwards, take all the provincial managements, national management, skills audit, determine who is skilled enough to do the job. But then I would start with a polygraph process and an investigation to determine who is there because of corruption or who was involved in corruption. And obviously, along with the skills audit, where you're appointed according to merit or political affiliation. And if it is the latter, you need to be removed. But Alec, I would make the accusation, and I stand to be corrected, that the entire police management has been captured. Um, I... I know it sounds it's very sad and everything, but we're in deep trouble. This is not something that's going to be fixed overnight. Um, Becky Trele has absolutely no clue what he's doing. Um, they call him, in, in many of the townships, they call him the Minister of Crime Scenes and Condolences um, because that's all he does. If he wastes taxpayer money to fly from place to place. There's zero strategic direction. I know of anti-gang cops that have been there for years that have never, ever had a specialized course. He came straight out of college. He was put in AGU. And, uh, and they shoot a few times a week sometimes. And they haven't had extra training. They put their lives on the line. Um, so the fish rots from the head. If we don't clear up the top, it's like sticking a plaster on a wound that needs surgery. Franz Cronier, who you uh, referenced earlier, in fact, he's, he's going to be with us next year. He said that on a recent visit to Cape Town, the mayor, Gordon Hill Lewis, invited him to come and see what the city was doing on the policing. And France was absolutely blown away. He said from the moment he got off the aeroplane to when he arrived at the venue, he was being monitored. So it's possible. And he said it was, it was through drones. And he then continued to explain how modern techniques were being used. So there is hope. Definitely. And, uh, and apart from the solutions around SAPS National, I think we need to zoom in on that. Um, I'm astounded by the amazing work that provincial law enforcement, uh, LEAP, as we know in the new initiative, Metro Police and even Traffic Police in the Western Cape, the, w the way they do things. The other night I was invited for a night out with the gang and drug task team uh, of City of Cape Town Metro. Uh, there were probably between 20 and 25 cops involved in the operation, all from Metro Police, um, and K9 unit, unit was also, also there. Now, if you can't, you can't, if someone can't look after an animal, the chances that they can look after a human is very small. And uh, when I got to the K9 unit kennels before we left, it's clean, animals are healthy, each dog has a badge with their name and their discipline on the gate, uh, animals are happy. Um, and, and I use that with specific reference because you can't expect, you know, to have, be successful if you can't do the basics right. Um, incredibly specialized. Not one of the places that we visited, including several drug houses, several raids that were done that night in gang-ridden areas, 
Not once did I see cops just smacking people. When I go with some of the SAPS members, you need to turn away sometimes because they, they I, I understand that there's, a, that there's a level of force that is used sometimes with violent criminals. And, and that's a debate for another day. But sometimes when you, when you spend time with certain cops, they just smack people for no reason. And Metro is so professional. They wear the uniform with pride. Their firearms work. Their vehicles work. They do communi- They communicate properly. A few years ago on a SAPS operation that I was invited to, I uh, was invited. They're going to raid a drug house. And they drove there with all their lights on. They parked right in front of the house and like nonchalantly walked to the door <laughs> and, and knocked. And I thought to myself, what's the point of why, why did you invite me? Do you want to show me how corrupt you are? Because you obviously told them you're coming. Um, and then with Metro, I was astounded. All not unmarked vehicles, they have a plan, they communicate properly, there's structure to it. So we need to devolve it. We need to give them detective uh, capacity. We need to build intelligence capacity. The only reason Minister Trele doesn't want to do that is because he wants to centralize power. It's an old socialist type of way of doing things. You centralize and we need to decentralize a federal decentralized system. You get what you vote for because we're not voting for Trele. If you live in the Western Cape, especially, we're not voting for him. So why do we have to suffer under his leadership? Yeah, you know, centralized power. Look at Eskom. But the, the the point that uh, that I think to to follow through on all of that, Herman Mashaba yesterday made a a very strong allegation that the ANC is trying to keep people uneducated through the awful education system, so that they can continue to be voted for. Is there, with your experience, because you you've seen this, is there a case to be made? in the Western Cape, that the ruling party, which you've described as a criminal syndicate, is willfully keeping the crime rate high through incompetence and corruption so that it can reflect badly on the one, one bad spot, if you like, yeah. in the governance of the DA there. Absolutely. So what they did, and it's actually been happening for the past, what is it, it's 2023, for the last... 13 years that I've, I've been watching the, the, the stats and the numbers, things like crime intelligence, detective shortages, et cetera, have been massive in the Western Cape. And, um, you know, we got to a point in places like Grassy Park where you've got uh, 1,600 people per cop. Now, the UN average is one per 300. You know, so it, it's impossible for those cops to do their job. So all they do is, and, and people don't understand that the provincial government and local government don't have a say over SAPs. It's a national body. They have nothing to do with it. And, and so what happens is that people then think, but why did they, why did they vote uh, this way if this is the, the police service that they're getting? And it's also unfair to those cops. I mean, if you can imagine if you're a detective and you've got between three and 500 dockets on your table, how do you work on that? How on earth do you work on that? Um, so my heart goes out to them. The amount of overtime they work without pay sometimes is, is astounding. And, uh, I want to ask everyone, you know, where we can support good cops. It sounds terrible to have to classify between good and bad cops, but when we can support them or help them in any way, we need to do that. Well, it sounds like at the, uh, further down the scale, there are a lot of really good people working, but the problem is higher up you and rest and and the the story that you shared with us about uh, Sipukazi boy was horrific and once more an illustration of it before we open up to the floor you said you wanted to make a comment about Gaten McKenzie and and what happened yesterday your thoughts yeah um i i'm disappointed that that there's time for for petty shows like yesterday and I, and I saw the tweet that was posted about the song because he saw that Helen Zillo was sitting in the front now it doesn't matter if it's Helen Zillo or anyone else um, if that's the type of, of principle or integrity that we want to move forward with in South Africa we're doomed to fail um, we need to call it out it's bad behavior it's arrogant and uh, and it, 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 it steps on people it, it it, you know, I heard the comment about wanting to teach Helen a lesson. Um, and, and I've heard that before about wanting to teach people in Pretoria a lesson from the same party and people from, uh, from Joburg a lesson. And I recently heard it from the Patriotic Alliance in Drakenstein as well. 
Um, we're not here to, to, to teach each other lessons. We're not surviving at the moment. 84 people will be murdered today. So while we're doing petty fights, 84 people are murdered. One person every 10 minutes is raped. If you, if you recall, the Patriotic Alliance began on the basis that it wanted to attack gang crime, gang criminality in the Cape Flats. That was actually their number one in 2013 priority. It seems to have been successful or not in that. It's non-existent. Attempt. Non-existent. You don't see it. Um, Mia Boeta's case is in an area in Paul East. Um, the specific place where she was murdered is very much gang ridden. Um, now we're lucky because we're focusing on a child murder. The, the gangsters literally look after our cars and stuff when we park there and we have to go into some of the shacks and everything to speak with the families and so on. But, uh, but, but it's, it's not there. There's no, there, there's no plan to put on. It's, it's, it's all talk and it's, and, and, and it's the showboating thing. It's, it's not only that, I, I, I don't want to make it sound like it's just one party or something like that. All I'm saying is that we shouldn't be playing cheap games while there's serious stakes. We don't have a lot of time left. We've got one chance to make this work, you know. Um, uh, yeah, so so I, I find it sad that there's a, a showboating type of type of uh, mentality while we have very, very serious work to do. And, and, and I, can, I can testify to the work that has been done in Cape Town with Metro Police. Because when I speak to those cops and I speak to good cops in SAPs, the SAPs cops all tell me, if you hear of a position in Metro, please tell me. They want to join um, because they want to be part of a winning team. And, uh, and yo, uh, if, imagine if we could do that, eh? if, if we were able to push. Part back. of the solution. Yeah. Time for questions. Audience engagement. Tell us if you have developed a policy plan to propose what should happen after 2024. Okay, so there's your segue into your solutions. Gladly. So if, if 2024, let's say something changes, uh, what needs to happen? Firstly, we need a skills audit. I spoke about the skills audit already. I'm not going to go over that again. It's logical. We need skilled, well-trained people. The first slide that I showed about organized crime, etc., we need to stop with the mentality of making mass arrests but zero convictions. We hear with crime stats release, you know, we've made uh, X hundred thousand of arrests on the following offense, but there's no conviction. So what's the point? They're just back out in the street. So we're creating an environment for criminals to become utterly professional in, in what they do. Spoke of polygraphs to determine, and I know polygraphs aren't always the be all and end all, but it makes someone nervous and it gives you an idea of where to start investigating. We said we need a special court for criminal cops. We can't wait for delays, etc. We need to clean it up definitively um, Andre Lincoln, amazing guy. If you could ever have an interview with him, do it. Okay, he was the last general commander of the anti-gang unit, a man of impeccable integrity, and he had a rule: if any of his members were caught to be corrupt, he would call a parade. Um, he would have them arrested and take their eps off in front of everyone. And uh, it might sound drastic in a South African context because we don't always see consequences like that. But that's the approach we need with law enforcement. You need to set a higher standard of integrity and the way you do things. IPID needs to be in independent. At the moment, IPID still feeds into the Minister of Police. We can't expect a Shoal Kenya investigation to truly be successful if IPID reports to the police minister that's currently destroying SAPs. Um, we need reservists again, logical. Training needs to be specialized. We've got a problem now. At least a third of last year's recruit in intake paid their way into the college. So many people that were found to be eligible to go to the college couldn't get access, but these ones paid their way in. We need to change that. Obviously, you can't, have, you can't start your career as a cop corrupt already and then expect to do a good job. Specialized units, logical. Forensic services, multiply it. We've got amazing universities, use them. Um, uh, provincial capacity, use them. Then we don't have these backlogs. And then devolution and, and federal policing. Um, I'm not going to go through in a policy structure now, but probably later this year, we've developed it as a policy document. So I assume probably by September, October, we'll be releasing it as a policy solution document. Maybe we can chat with you about it then about what the broader 
policy approach and practical changes would uh, entail to to solve this. Okay. Final question, and it, it links to what Graham asked as well. Yesterday, Gaten McKenzie, he's a criminal, the general of the 26 gang. He says he would bring back the death penalty because he knows that at the moment, uh, if I'm not going to be killed for killing someone, it doesn't matter. I will kill them if I really wanted to. And the chances of everything that, that, that you've outlined, first of all, the low conviction rates, so you probably get away with it. If you don't get away with it, you can probably bribe some heavy general to, to let, get you out of the cells. Would you agree with, with his very practical approach? Not, not if it's his approach. Um, uh, I think the death penalty is a debate on its own. The problem is if you can't trust the government to keep the lights on, how are you going to trust them to kill the right person? Um, um, you know, so it's, it's very easy to talk death penalty. I see it on Twitter all the time. I say, bring death penalty back. You want death penalty for someone that can't even fix a pothole. How are they going to arrest and convict the right person and then hang that person? You know, so I would be very careful. It, it's, it's not, it's not quite that simple. Um, El Salvador's president is doing amazing work with how they counted gangs and their homicide rate has shot down and they use minimal force, eh? They, they just dominate areas, intelligence-driven operations, and the incarceration and recovery process or rehabilitation, rehabilitation process is, uh, is quite good, it seems. And it seems to be working. So, so there are other approaches that we can follow. But no, I wouldn't just bring something like that in, not with a, with a lack of trust that we have at the moment with government. Ian Cameron, thank you. Thank you very much. 